Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR Spreadsheet. I'm Pierce Future. You can find me on Twitter at Race for the Prize. You can also find me at RaceForThePrize.com, or you can go find my articles that I've been writing for the last decade at DK Network and the videos I've been doing there for since the beginning, the dawn of DFS, basically for all intents and purposes, at DK Network, DK Nation. But today, just go to RaceForThePrize.com. That's where you get access to the Fantasy NASCAR Spreadsheet. If you want to feel like you're in control of your lineups, if you maybe you're tired of just tailing the touts and following the leader and making the picks that they make, and look, there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're in a rush on Saturday and you're trying to build an Xfinity lineup, you want to get some action. But if you are like a NASCAR purist or you're really in the fantasy NASCAR DFS, then you should know by now that's really not a good strategy because if you watch the shows and they say, here are the picks, then you and the other you know eight or a thousand people that are watching that show are going to play the same picks. So it really doesn't help you that much. I guess early in the week, it gives you an idea of where to go, and then you know how to build lineups. But if it's like you know a couple hours before lock or on the day of the race, and here are the picks, and then you play the picks, and if the picks hit, then guess what? You're splitting that thing. You're cutting it. So what I would advise is build your own lineups. And the only way you can build your own lineups and feel comfortable and confident and have fun and really enjoy the racing and enjoy the data and analytics is get the spreadsheet. And for 30 bucks this month, and it changes depending on the amount of sheets that I have to work on because I'm putting these things together and compiling and aggregating and projecting and putting a lot of work into it. You can't get this much data anywhere else. Nobody is going to provide you with all of this data. And you'll see, and you can see it in some of these videos, some of the stuff that I throw at you. Sure, you can get projections at other places and picks at other places. Like, all right, well, how'd you get that pick? I just got it. Leave me alone. Well, can I see the data that drove you to it? Just get out of here, kid. How did you come up with these projections? Get out of here, kid. Well, you can see where my projections come from. You can see where my picks come from because you can see every single data point in the spreadsheet. It is an amazing amount of quantitative data for the clash and for three Daytona races, Cup Xfinity trucks, two duels, three races at Atlanta, three more sheets at Las Vegas. You can get projections lap by lap data from the practices. Now I don't always, not always able to scrape that data, it depends, but I try to do my best to be very consistent with getting you all the laps from practice, at least the lap averages from practice. And after every race, you can see lap by lap what a driver did, their performance and try to break that down. One of the things I'm gonna try to do here in the coming days is we kind of glanced at this in the previous podcast, looking at last year's clash lap by lap data. Again, I'm not just gonna tell you the picks. I'm not gonna just give you a fish. I'll show you how to fish. I want to work with you. I want to work together. I want to dive into NASCAR, explore NASCAR, have fun looking at the data. If you just want the picks, just Google it, man. If you just Google NASCAR picks, there's plenty of articles. You don't even have to spend any time watching shows. Or just look at what people tweet out. They're going to tweet out the picks. But if you play the picks, it's not going to be that helpful. So one of the things I want to do in the upcoming days, probably future podcasts, you can see the data points. Like Eric Almirola, lap one, two, three, four, five, he's in first place. You can really track what drivers are doing and really get a handle of, did this driver understand the clash last year? Did they run well at the clash last year? As we talked about in the previous podcast, you'll see you know, a driver like, was it, Alex Bowman, who loses four spots. Now, you're not going to completely have all the context, so you would really want to go back and watch that race, but if you don't, I'm here for you to explain that a lot of times when a driver drops four spots at a short flat track like this, then they mainly just got out of line, and then the, the freight train came on the inside, they got locked out, lost four spots before they could get back down. It doesn't really indicate that, oh, he really struggled on this run. No, it's just it, life comes at you fast type of situation. That's not going to be the case at other tracks. So context always is going to matter when we're looking at this lap by lap data, but having that known pretty well at the clash, we can differentiate that. Now, if we were to see him to drop one spot after another on a run or gain spots one after another on a run, then we can kind of start to lean toward, hey, maybe this guy knows what he's doing. Maybe he's a pretty solid racer. And we see that with Ryan Priest throughout this race, 16th, the 15th, the 13th, the 12th. All right, another restart, 11th, 10th. And it's not like he's gobbling all these up on restarts and things are going his way. He's methodically out driving people, getting underneath them, making the moves, or watching a battle in front of him and making the right moves. A very solid race for him by breaking his data down. So one of the things I want to do in the future races, and you can do this on your own, um, what I will simply do is just duplicate the lap sheet 
and then at the end of each run or before a caution, insert a column, and then just do a, a simple uh, mathematical equation called this minus this, their starting position on that run minus their finishing position. That's going to give me a number. That'll show me how many spots they gained or lost. And we can look at that through the race from all the different runs and get a feel for who really ran well in last year's clash. That's for a future podcast. I think today we'll probably deal a little bit more with the dual races because that's the, the spreadsheet I've been messing around with lately. Just grinding out the spreadsheets at racefieldprize.com for you. I got to get the, you know, Atlanta and Las Vegas worked out, but we're getting there. We're plowing through. Actually, Atlanta's probably pretty much done too. And then Las Vegas, but got to get to work on those. And then they are living organisms. They're always updated throughout the week. I'm always adding more data points to them. But the one most recent on my mind is the duels. Now, before I get into that, um, Friday, Friday, let me see some of my notes, things that I wanted to possibly talk about. You got notes on things to talk about? It doesn't sound like it. No, no, sometimes it doesn't sound like it, it doesn't at all. But again, racefortheprize.com, why my notes pop up. Another thing I always like to look at is sports on TV. If you're interested, it's my website. If you expect some downtime, like, yeah, let's see what's going to go on. Always like to look at this. And maybe plan on something that I'm not going to watch. Kind of like your Netflix queue. Like, yo, I like this thing. And then you add it and you never watch it. It's just like browsing the video store. I may be an English teacher now, but once upon a time, a young Pierce Dietrich was a video store clerk. Now, in your mind, you might have thought, if you even know what that is, if you're that young and old enough. If you're old enough, you might think, oh, yeah, that was a fantasy job. I always wanted to do that. It was not. It was a terrible job. You just watch movies all day. No, you don't. What do you think I'm going to put on Pulp Fiction? And then people are walking in, and there's a various dungeon scene happening. You can't watch R-rated movies at the small town video store. And if you dare put a video in, it better be some Disney thing. So you don't really, like the highlight of working at the video store was getting a pizza sub from three places down. Now the problem was there's a pizza sub place three places down. So basically, I was earning a paycheck to buy pizza subs every day. And you don't even want to know what minimum wage was. And look, hire Bobcats. Leading out the basketball slate. That's exciting. They'll probably lose. Uh, you got basically every sport you can imagine is going on. No big events here on Friday night. Uh, but there are a lot of racing. Again, I encourage everybody to sign up for Flow Racing. If you have not, I know I, it's another package. I can't afford another package. Well, this should be on top of your list. Cancel all of your others. Get this. Real I mean, racing season kind of went through an off season. Not really. I mean, if you're like me, watch the Tulsa shoot out on flow. The uh, you know, I even got the snowball derby this year, so racing never ended for me. Maybe it'll never end for you. That's what this show is about. But this week we got Florida Speed Weeks, you got Mesa Super Bowl dirt racing at Golden Isle. There'll be dirt racing, there's even snow derby. Snowmobile racing is pretty fun, guys. Next week. For Tom Flo Racing will be the I-500. That's a 500-mile snowmobile race. It's all day long. My brother-in-law has been there a couple times trying to drag me up there. I'm saying, man, I can't do the cold. I can't do it. He might have an event someday we're watching in his nice, comfortable house. But I think I'll watch it in my nice, comfortable house this year. Last year's 500-mile race, it's an all-day race, basically. Came down to the last lap. You can go to YouTube and watch it. Anyway, Flo Racing, tons of racing there. IMSA this, is this weekend. You've got the Rolex 24 hours on Peacock and NBC in USA. You should watch that. Kicking it off was already yesterday. That that Mazda race was at 4 p.m. yesterday. That was awesome, man. Mazda MX-5, some of the best racing that you can see. Um, when they go to Martinsville in the future, it's going to be absolutely amazing. And you bet your butt I will be there. No brainer. Yeah, I'm excited about that, but that's probably years down the road. Uh, they always kick off the season at Daytona. The first race was yesterday at 10 a.m. Friday, or at 4 p.m. Friday at 10 a.m. will be the second race. We'll see if Gresham Wagner can do it again. Amazing finish. Check that out on YouTube. Back to our duels. And I'm all over the place. Oh, yeah. Now I was going to talk about, oh, yeah, you got Royal Rumble this weekend if you want. I'm going to go to the circus, probably some Chuck E. Cheese. It'll be fun. What else? What else? Yeah, I think that'll do it for notes. Those were your notes. That's what you're pulling up. 
Yeah, my notes were um, Royal Rumbles this weekend and uh, reminding myself to go to the circus and Chuck E. Cheese's. Those are just regular notes. Those are not podcast notes. I don't know, I'm trying to open up and share more. I'm more than just a data guy. I'm a data dad. Data dad. Yeah, that's probably going to be data dad. It's probably already taken. Register trademark just now. The YouTube video was demonetized. I think that's why I do this thing is to help just have that money to pay for stuff for my son's babysitter. Used to, and the babysitter is much more affordable than daycare, but we're not out of the woods yet. Because he was born just a little too late in November, that meant a double dose of preschool. So when you're preschool, you're not every day. So that means I got to get a babysitter on those off days. But next year, he finally will go to kindergarten. I remember when they realized, like, all right, he's ready for kindergarten. And I looked down at the sheet of paper that they had in front of them, the teacher, and I'm like, you guys got his birthday wrong. Like, wait, what? And then they dropped. They looked at me, huh? Like, yeah, he's only four. He's not five. And there was this moment of shock and panic, and I realized. Now, one part, like, out of, you know, like, oh, yeah, this is impressive. This kid is already ready for kindergarten. Awesome. Which really doesn't mean anything any of you guys. Take it from my years in education. There's some people that get a head start in kindergarten. They'll fall back. And some people are really slow in kindergarten, and they'll catch up. Like, Great, you're smart at four years old. Have a cookie. And literally, you probably want to give that kid a cookie because they love cookies. Oreo, golden version. Dunk it, don't dunk it, whatever. Pull the top off, lick the cream in the middle. However you want to consume a cookie, it's fine by me. It's your cookie. You earned it. You are the smartest four-year-old in the world. But the real panic was that, oh, my God, we got to deal with this kid for another year. (laughs) It wasn't so much that they were impressed that, wow. It was more like, oh no, the dread. Yes, that's right. You have to deal with my hellion for one more year. And I have to pay for babysitting for a whole nother year. And so the way that I'll help pay for that is by selling and slinging the spreadsheets. Also, though, we need to get some kitchen cabinets and food prices are expensive. It just seems like a default thing that you'd say, but it really is true. It's, the world out there ain't cheap. Okay. Been going off on some tangents. We're looking at the dual sheet. And we can see, we'll, we'll wrap up with some dual stuff here. Again, racesurprise.com. If you didn't know, and if you're one of the handful of people that love to hit dislike on the video, that's okay. If you're one of the handful that like to hit like, then you do know this podcast and this video is just really a running advertisement for the spreadsheet. Don't want to get you into the spreadsheet. And you can see it in front of you. It's an infomercial. It's like a Saturday morning before college comes on or Sunday morning before the NFL comes on, the guy's selling you some sort of cooking device. That's what this is. I want you to buy the cooking device. And it's an actual one that really works. Like George Foreman was pretty much a hit. This one isn't uh, set it and forget it. Although some people will swear by it, but imagine I'm selling you a George Foreman. So here is the pitch to buy the George Foreman. We can see, like, you know, projection data. I haven't punched that in yet. These are just random numbers typed in, so don't worry about that. So our first columns here, in through V, gives us their DFS finishing position in each duel. So Zane Smith scored the fifth most fantasy points in his dual race. Joey Logano, second most. And one of the interesting things you can see clearly here, again, spreadsheets are pretty simple to read. I know some people want to say, oh, just give me the picks. I don't want to look at all these numbers. I don't understand. Green is good, red is bad. Thank you. Uh, you can see here that Logano is scoring really well. He's scoring a lot of fantasy points. Second most fantasy points in 2023. Not a good race in 2022, but then you look at 21, fourth most, 20 most. 2019 duel, he scored the second most. 2018, he scored the most. So a lot of solid points from him. Kevin Harvick, not great lately, but in terms of fantasy points, you go from 2020 to 2016, which really was a different Kevin Harvick. Again, like, why do you have Kevin Harvick on there? He's not going to be racing this year. This last year's names are still embedded in the sheet. I haven't changed the names. I will change the names. They're just sitting there, place centers, so we can see some data points. Oh, okay, that makes sense. I was just wanting to yell at you. That's okay. I understand. People like to do that in, in all phases of my life at home. At work, well, actually, it's not that bad at work. You get more nagging at work. It's been actually a great experience for me. Very awesome. Better than my previous years in education. Night and day. Yeah, much more people yelling at me in the past. 
And then when I do the spreadsheet, people yelling at me in the comments with the big old downward thumb dislike. Over here in columns Y through AG, we can see their actual finishing position. So you can see that Joe Logano won the race in 2023, won the race in 2020, won the dual race in 2019. Pretty clear. Got it. Awesome. Now over here we can see starting position. It's always important because at a plate track, place differential means everything. So it would behoove us to really look at the patterns of, all right, yeah, we need to know where they're finishing. Yeah, we need to know how many fantasy points they're scoring in terms of the other drivers. We also want to look and see where are these guys typically starting. If they're scoring points, is it just a stack in the back? Is this different than your regular restricted plate races? Is this a traditional Daytona or Talladega? Are there as many wrecks? Is the points going to be the same? Well, we can see all that here. And then last, we can see what is Joe Logano's average starting position. What is his average finish? Thus, what does he average in terms of place differential? Then we look and see how many times did he have a top six DFS score in the last, what, one, two, in the last eight dual races. And we can calculate all of that data. And we can rank, and we'll rank it by that. And it is, it's ranked right now on their percentage. So obviously Zane Smith is 100%. He had a top six score, but he's only been in one race. Nonetheless, it counts. It's a top six score. That's more. That's definitely going to be in the optimal lineup. It's just a small sample size, hard to trust. They want to be like, well, 100% of the time he does it, so i got to play him every time. Well, no, it's a small sample size. You would much feel much more confident playing Joey Logano, who has been in six top six positions. And I'm not technically saying optimal because – we're drawing data back before DFS existed. So the data is pretty clear there. We can see Harvick, that's not really gonna to matter to us. So uh, Christopher Bell though, in four races, three times, he has finished with a top six score and his starting position has been right in the middle. And that's kind of the sweet spot. If we look at on average, like these are not big numbers. You look at Joe Logano on average, he is only scoring three place differential points. And this is something I'm probably going to break down a little bit more in the previous video. How much place differential do we want? And should we weigh finishing position points more than place differential? You know, a typical plate race, we're always chasing 10, 20 place differential points. The duels tend to be a little bit more conservative and obviously they're going to score less points. Because there's just fewer drivers in the field, fewer to leapfrog, it's just, all right, well, how many place differential do we need? We simply just say, oh, well, the, the field at Daytona is 40, this is a 20, so let's just cut our expectations in half. Well, if you did that, like, typically we're looking for 15 to 20 place differential points in those big races, which also tend to be more chaotic and have more opportunity for drivers to leapfrog leapfrog through the field. But even we just go with some simple math and cut them in half, so like, I don't know. <sighs> Say we cut that 15 and a half and say eight. Well, on average, Logano's only getting three. And he is in six of the eight winning lineups for all intents and purposes. You can't say that exactly because we're drawing from data from 2016 where oh, actually I guess there was uh yeah, I mean basically that it is an optimal line of performance. So he's clearly under that eight marks. We'll talk about that in a future podcast about the duels of how to weigh place differential. I'm going to look at our buckets, our scoring bucket, our finishing position bucket, our place differential bucket, our uh, hog point bucket, our hog trough, or dominator drawer. Yeah, you can tell. This guy loves his alliteration. He is an English teacher. So you can see some general numbers of what works and then obviously what doesn't work. Guys that go backwards are not going to be in optimal lineups. Guys that go backward on average, guys that start up front go to the back for whatever reason, mainly because they don't want to lose their starting grid in the Daytona 500, you name it. But the drivers seem to show the tendency of, oh, I'm not going to the back, I'm going to go out there and race. And we can get a general idea, but if you just want some names while we close out the podcast today, from the names on the screen, Legon, these are not, this is not the comprehensive list because I'm only looking at the drivers from one duel from last season, but Legon is six for eight. Bell is three for four, Bubba Wallace is four for six, Ryan Blaney's five for eight, Busher's four for eight, Austin Dillon's four for eight. So among the drivers with a decent sample size, they have been the guys that have scored a lot of fantasy points in the duels. 
and they really haven't gotten there through a lot of place differential points. I would expect them to score a little bit more on average. And I think five from Bubba Wallace seems about right, and that would be the number that I would target. But it looks like you don't really – now, obviously, this is on average, so there's going to be people in the winning lineup that are going to score more than that. But on average, getting to the top and scoring points seems to favor more of, you know, look, here's the correlation that intrigues me is that here are the guys that are scoring top sixes or optimal days in DFS, and they're not really at the leaderboard in place differential, but they all do have one thing in consistent. They're getting top five finishes. One guy that isn't is Blaney, but I'm sure that that's way down by a couple of races that are killing his average. He's got this 14 and a 19 in 2020-2017. But other than that, all of his actual finishes are sixth or better. He's got a win. He's got three third-place finishes. So his average is a little bit skewed some. But my initial thought as we close out the podcast here at RaceForThePrize.com is that finishing position matters more than place differential. We'll explore that later as I dive deeper into this sheet and other sheets. And if you... As always, we'll get access to the sheet. Go to raceforthprize.com. Support me. I'll support you. Help me. Help you. Feel like you are in control of your picks so you can be fully immersed and really enjoying playing fantasy NASCAR and not just playing the picks. So okay to display the picks, especially if you're ending 150 lineups. More than likely, not good to get deep into the data. If you're putting tons of cash into this, then just use the sims, use the tools. If you're trying to get rich, that's a good idea. If you just want to play fantasy NASCAR and have fun, then this is the place for you. Thanks for joining me. Love you guys. Trivia Light's fantastic.